Hey everyone, welcome to the photo department. It has been over a month, I think almost, since I've posted a video. December was probably the worst month in memory for me personally. It was just a really tough time and it was difficult to make time to produce content and upload it. So I'm sorry about that but it's the middle of January and things are picking up and we're feeling good, so I'm back. I'm going to go once again and say that I'm gonna to try to do this as a weekly thing. If I can do that, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm dedicated to trying to do this, but as a one-man operation, it can be difficult and I'm not immune to personal issues, so I love you guys. I love this channel, I love doing this. So I'm going to make a real effort to do this more often. Today, I am drinking some coffee from my friends in Sebastopol at Retrograde Roasters. I'm drinking it out of a Heath Ceramics mug. I think this is the third third mug I own. Uh, it's very hip and in vogue to like and enjoy the Heath Ceramics product line, but for good reason. This stuff is very quality, super nicely made, obviously very beautiful. Uh, not super inexpensive, but also I've seen more expensive ceramic pieces, so I mean you get what you pay for and it's true. It really is. Mm. And you get really good quality with Heath. The coffee that I'm drinking from Retrograde Roasters is their first natural processed coffee. It's the Sadamo Guji from Ethiopia. Uh, a little bit of background about Retrograde. I went to high school with Danielle, one of the owners. Um, and her and her partner started this company a couple years back. They had a coffee cart that they would bring to weddings or events, and it was a hit. They opened up their very first brick and mortar store last year in Sebastopol, and they just recently in January had their one year anniversary. So congratulations, Danielle and Casey. Uh, your coffee's fantastic. They roast all their own coffee. You know, Casey is studious and extremely dedicated to roasting coffee and learning more about roasting coffee and trying things. This is the first time trying their hand at a natural processed coffee, which it's amazing. So good job guys. I love it. You can find these guys online. I'll put a link in the description. Definitely, definitely check them out if you're a coffee lover. Support small mom and pop shops. That being said, the coffee world has been turned upside down yet again. Recently we heard about the allegations of sexual harassment being brought against Four Barrel Coffee, and as a former employee of Four Barrel, I cannot say that I'm surprised. Sadly, even sadder is how long it took for any sort of action to be taken in regards to Four Barrel and the specialty coffee industry when it comes to sexual harassment in the workplace. It's rampant, and it's inexcusable and it keeps happening and it doesn't make any sense. There are a lot of people who are talking about it, who are analyzing it, who are bringing these people to task for their actions, which is fantastic. So there's a podcast that I follow uh, about the coffee industry. It's called the Boss Barista Podcast and it's hosted by Ashley and Jasper who are Bay Area coffee professionals and they are super rooted in the Bay Area coffee industry and the specialty industry as a whole. Uh, from their website, uh, Boss Barista is a feminist coffee podcast hosted by Jasper Wilde and Ashley Rodriguez. We highlight the voices of those marginalized and overlooked in the coffee industry. So that description does tell what the podcast is about in so many words, but it's so much more than that. It is uh, extremely well done, very thoughtful. Ashley and Jasper are incredibly, I would say, qualified to speak on all these topics, and I think they do them all very great service, and I think that this podcast is very important for anybody who's in the industry or anyone who just enjoys coffee. It's really important to look at these issues and discuss them in a thoughtful manner, and this podcast does exactly that. Uh, Ashley is actually a contributor and the online web editor for the Barista Magazine, this is the latest copy, just got this today. You should also check out Barista Magazine. Uh, it is really great for those of you who are in the professional capacity in the industry, but it's also a really informative, super well done magazine that 
highlights all sorts of social issues as well as things happening in the industry. Uh, Sarah, who is the editor-in-chief, is a wonderful person. I've worked for Barista Magazine professionally before providing photographs for stories. So I would say check it out. They have a great online presence and their subscription is fantastic. It's I think every two months and it's a really great magazine. So check that out as well. One last super serious thing I wanted to bring up just because we're here and it's ongoing. <sighs> I have definitely spent some time bitching about Instagram publicly and privately. Instagram has been integral in helping me grow my business and a lot of other photographers businesses as well it's the best platform for posting your work and having people see it and recent years instagram has done everything that they can to monetize the platform and basically what that means is that if it makes them money they're going to go for it if it doesn't make them money they don't care about it Unfortunately, most photographers, like 99% of them on the platform, don't make them any money, so they don't care whether people see our work or not, which is why the algorithm sucks so bad, and which is why there are so many changes that everyone kind of like moans and groans about, but no one actually does anything like protest by not using Instagram, or, I don't know, make a new program, make some other app that's better, that allows everybody to get their work seen equally. Regardless, I think the point is, no matter what side you follow on Instagram, it doesn't matter. Instagram doesn't care about you or your work. All Instagram cares about is monetization. And that is the hard reality when it comes to anything like YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, any of the other apps that you share and your content on. They don't care about you or your work. All they care is if they can use your content to somehow make them money. So that's it. Just who cares? Use it. Don't use it. It doesn't matter. There's not going to be one super fire posts that you make on Instagram that's going to blow your career up. It's just not going to happen. It doesn't ever happen. The only way that people on Instagram blow up is if they're connected or they're in the right place, right time, where nowadays photography just happens to be super saturated. There is no right place, right time anymore. It's all about who you know. So just forget it. doesn't matter. Have fun with it. That's all that matters now. Story time. Full disclosure, this video is about the Mamiya RB67 medium format camera. For those of you who don't want to watch the entire video, I'll tell you right now, to summarize the whole thing, if you are getting into photography and you want to do film and you want to do portraiture or product photography or landscapes, this camera is worth every cent. Right now, as this video goes up, there are no less than three full kits, including lens, uh, viewfinder, film back, whatever, on eBay right now, buy it now for less than $400. So you can buy this entire camera kit that has everything you need to start taking pictures the day you get it, except for film. You can get it for under $400 right now if you go to eBay, which is incredible for what this system can do, especially because the system is relatively complex for how easy it is to use, but that complexity lends itself to a lot of different uses, if that makes any sense. The long version of the story is I did a video a couple months back about my Pentax 6.7 and most people who know me or who follow me on Instagram will know that I absolutely love, love, love the Pentax 6.7. That camera is amazing. So <laughs> I was doing a photo shoot at a pool and I left my camera on the tripod on the deck next to the pool and it was stemmed up quite a bit the weight of the camera was a little too high for the center of gravity and then I walked away to do something and it toppled over landing on the top right corner of the camera denting it and causing the uh, winding mechanism to stop working which sucks okay so that happened I had a bunch of work coming up that week so I had to kind of scramble and get another six seven body so that I can continue doing my work so I went on eBay and I found another body it works great. I've been using it for a couple months and then two weeks ago I was on a shoot and when I developed the film I had two shots on the entire film that was that came out. They came out great. They are amazing shots. But the rest of the shots, everything else is blank. Which leads me to believe that something was wrong with the shutter because there's just nothing. No exposure at all. Uh, turns out that above 250th of a second or 125th I think um, the shutter speeds 
were inconsistent and too fast. And so what was happening is I was getting like, I don't know, at a thousandth of a second, I was getting, I don't know, way faster than that. Basically what was happening is I was just not exposing at all. So I sent the camera out to Eric, who is the ultimate Pentax repair guy. Uh, he told me it would cost $400 to update and fix the camera, which is the cost of a new body. So now I am with no camera for my work. I will use medium format for most of my work, so I was kind of stuck. I have a Roloflex that I'm borrowing from a friend that is a great camera, but I'm not really a big on 6x6 anymore. And also TLRs have a very specific kind of workflow when you're shooting them and it doesn't really lend itself to the way I shoot and then I was thinking you know when I got my original RB67 it was really cheap it was like 300 bucks for the whole kit maybe I can find another one online and get that here quick so I can start doing more work and then get my Pentax fixed and then go from there well so what I did was I ordered an RB67 off of eBay uh, it got here in two days uh, it came with a 180 millimeter lens which is about 85 millimeters uh, on full frame, so it's about a portrait, it's a good portrait lens. And then I also purchased a 90 millimeter, which is like a 50 millimeter lens. And remembered why I love that camera so much. It is amazing. I'm still trying to figure out whether I'm gonna get my Pentax fixed or not. It's super expensive, but either way, I'm gonna have to buy a new body or fix it. So either buy a new body and risk that need repair, or get this one fully repaired and know it'll last me a long time. $400 is a lot, and I'm two bodies in. I've already bought two Pentax bodies, and they're both broken. And the first one I broke, I don't even know if I can fix that one. And if I can, how much is that going to cost? So currently, I'm using the Mamiya RB67 for my medium format work. And here she is. I have the meter prism that I got. So I didn't need the meter prism, and I don't think anyone really does. I have my phone. I have a handheld meter. I have plenty of ways to figure out the exposure, but this was on sale on eBay, buy it now for super cheap. And I thought, you know, what the hell, it might be fun. Turns out it's pretty great. It works really well. I did some tests with the 90 millimeter lens and the exposures were like dead on, which is really great. It does add a bunch of weight and size to the camera. But the one thing about the RB67 that I never really loved was being stuck with the waist level viewfinder. I do love the waist level viewfinder, which I also have. It's really cool looking down into the camera and framing shots this way can be really fun, but you're always looking down and because of that, you have to hold the camera low, which means, you know, if there's a shot that you wanna get that's up here, you have to be above the camera to see anything, which is tough. So I got the metered prism so I can look at it at a 45 degree angle like I would a normal camera. Now I'm going to be using this prism for product photography, uh, portraits in the studio, stuff where I need to have the camera up a little bit higher. Uh, but for stuff like landscapes, this is great. I love this. Or maybe just walking around. Let's be honest, this is not really a walking around camera. It's pretty heavy. But if this is going to be living on the tripod most of the time, which this camera will, it is kind of amazing. There are a couple things about it that are a little bit limiting, but I've never found it to be much of an issue. So the lenses for this camera are fantastic. Like I said, I have the, oh, got some crap on the front element. I literally am cleaning off croissant flakes from the front element of my lens. I wish this was surprising. This is the, 180 millimeter f4.5, which is a really great portrait lens. It's longer, it's like an 85 equivalent. The lenses for the RB67 and RZ67, which is the later all electronic version, uh, are breech lock, meaning that you place it on the mount and then it has a ring you turn to lock it into place. And the lenses have the shutter inside them. So these are leaf shutter lenses. What that means is that you can sync your flash up to 400th of a second, which is pretty fast. Most DSLRs and mirrorless cameras sync speeds like 1 1 25th of a second or maybe 250th of a second, but um, 400th of a second is pretty fast. 
but 400th of a second is also the top speed for these lenses. I haven't found that to be much of an issue. Uh, I believe the reason that 400th of a second is the top speed has to do with this massive mirror in there. I don't know if you can see that, but I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and so there's a big big mirror in there, and that mirror is dampened pretty well, so there's not a lot of vibration issues, which is great. I've been able to handhold this camera and take an exposure at 30th of a second without any mirror shake causing any blur, which is really cool. But getting that big mirror out of the way so that the lens can fire is going to take a lot of effort. And if you move it too fast, you're going to get a lot of mirror shake and slap. And if it goes too slow, it's obviously not going to be fast enough for fast shutter speeds. But I think they figured out 400th of a second is the fastest they can get that mirror out of the way. So yeah, you're going to miss a little bit. You're not going to get like high speed sync or anything. This lens came with a lens hood, but it fits both lenses. I think it fits all the lenses. So I put it on the 90 millimeter when I'm using that one outside. These are the C lenses, which means these are the coated lenses, but they're the first generation. So they're only single coated. What that means is that lens flare is not going to be as controlled as with later lenses like the KL Mamiya lenses have multi coatings and those control flare and chromatic aberration a lot better than the C lenses. That being said, quality wise, I've never seen a difference. I've had both lenses. The C lenses I think are amazing for the price. They're really, really cheap, but they're super, super, super sharp. Uh, great detail, color rendering, everything. These are fantastic lenses. So the reason that the RB67 is called an RB67 is that the film back here rotates. And that is really freaking cool for a couple of reasons. Well, one reason. This camera would be really difficult to turn sideways if it's on a tripod. One, because it's massive and heavy. And two, because there's no mount on this side. So unless you have a three axis head, you're not gonna be able to move it to the side very easily. And then trying to handhold this sideways to get a landscape shot, or a, I mean a portrait shot, that's, that's crazy. So what Mamiya did in order to fix that is that they made the back able to rotate. So in the normal position, it is horizontal and you're getting your landscape orientation on the 6.7. When you rotate it, bam, portrait. And it's literally as simple as that. Uh, they have different backs available. This one's the 120. There are 220 backs, which are obviously kind of useless because no one really makes 220 size film anymore. There are Polaroid backs. There are 645 backs that you can do. There's six by six backs. 6x8. Uh, moral of the story is that all those backs are compatible with this rotating adapter, and so all you have to do is just attach it to this rotating thing, and is, they all can rotate. Also, something that's really cool with this camera, instead of focusing on the lens barrel, it is bellows focused. See that? Bellows. Okay, so I'll give you kind of a, a reason why that's cool. And I have no scientific knowledge of, of to why this is the way it is. So I'm just going to explain it in the simplest terms that I can think of, which is because you are moving the lens away from the film plane rather than focusing an internal element, you are able to focus this lens a lot closer to your subject. So something like the 90 millimeter lens, one on like a mirrorless or DSLR is not going to be able to focus as close as like this would be able to. Uh, what that means is you can do macro photography with a non-macro lens, which is really cool. It's not going to be one-to-one, -one, but you can get pretty close. And it's also a lot easier to focus with bellows and be really super kind of accurate because it's just so like that. On a lens, you can like bump the focus ring a little easier. There's also a lock here. So if you focus it, you lock it, it won't move. That's really neat. So there are a couple things in this camera that I don't really love, but I still love because it's kind of what makes this camera this camera is uh, ergonomically, it's not super easy to handle. It's basically a huge box with a lens and a film back attached to it. Uh, there's not a lot of elegant gripping action going on here. The Pentax 6.7 just seems like an oversized SLR. So 
it's very comfortable. It's very recognizable. You have it in your hand and you're just like, oh, it's just a humongous regular camera, whatever. Very easy to use. This one is just a box with a lens viewfinder and back attached to it, so it's not super grippy. Uh, it's also heavy, heavy and bulky, but I mean, you can tell by looking at it that it is. Uh, another thing ergonomically about this camera that's kind of a pain in the butt, but if you are shooting this camera, you're already slowing down and kind of being deliberate about what you're doing, so it's not really an issue. Uh, you have, uh, you shoot your exposure, you take a shot, and then to go to the next frame, you have to reset the lens um, shutter, and you have to reset the mirror inside, so this is what this lever's for, but you also have to turn this lever on the back to advance the film to the next frame. Uh, a lot of people complain about that, but I think it's funny to complain about that. You're already using this big bulky camera. What's one extra step? Like, who cares? Uh, the cool thing about it is there are um, multiple exposure interlocks on the uh, Pro S and Pro SD backs that keep you from making multiple exposures. So if you forget to do this, it's not going to let you shoot a frame. So you won't be like, oh, I made a bunch of multiple exposures and ruined my whole shoot. Uh, but also... You can turn that off if you want to do multiple exposures, which is pretty cool. Also, there's a little red indicator flag that pops up in the counter window when you have already made a shot on one frame and you want to, at a glance, look to see if you've, if you've advanced it, you can't remember, it'll tell you, which is pretty cool. So, yes, obviously, it's a pain in the butt to be having to do a second lever turn, but like, is it really that much more of a pain? I mean, you already have to remember the dark slide put that put that back because if you don't take that out you won't let you take a shot either so you won't accidentally take a shot with a dark slide in place cool so yeah i mean this camera does kind of its best work on a tripod because it's big bulky there's a lot of stuff going on uh but what that means is you gotta have a tripod with you which yeah i know that's hard that's difficult but you know i didn't want to have to say this i didn't want to have to be the one to tell you uh, you know, it's such a beautiful day outside, but you know, photography is difficult if you're doing it right. Uh, it's not easy. You have to carry things. You have to set things up. You have to go places. You have to get out of bed and take like a shower or a bath. Then you have to go outside and talk to people, interact, be social. And that sucks. But it's great. A lot of people get into photography nowadays and they think it's going to be all puppies and bunny rabbits and money, but uh, it's more puppies and bunny rabbits than money, and it's rarely puppies and bunny rabbits, so consider that, I guess. Uh, that being said, um, who would I recommend this camera to? If you're a beginner, I'm going to recommend you a 35mm SLR just because there's so many of them and they're easy to use and it's a great introduction to film. But if you're a beginner who's been shooting 35mm already and you want to get into medium format, this is a really great way to do it, especially for cheap. Like I said, 300 bucks, 400 bucks for the whole system. Also, you could get into a twin lens reflex camera like this Roloflex but this is more complicated, why not go this route? Uh, if you are a photographer already and you've been shooting digital or film and you wanna get into medium format on a budget because you don't have a ton of money to throw around for cameras, which is usually the case with photographers, uh, this is a fantastic option. It's very versatile. There's tons of different viewfinders and backs and lenses you can get for it. It's completely modular, so it can be whatever camera you need it to be. I think it is really great at portraits, especially with this 180 millimeter lens. Uh, even the 90 millimeter lens is really great for portraits. Uh, obviously good for landscapes if you have a wide enough lens like the 50 millimeter f4 or 5, I believe. It's really great for product photography because of the bellows that allow close focusing. So I use this for product photography quite a bit. Um, also, I love using this for editorial stuff. Uh, much like lifestyle or product photography, editorial photography kind of takes a lot of setting up or a lot of storytelling. I like to slow down with this camera to kind of tell a story. I feel that it lends itself to that really well, especially with the 45 degree metered prism. 
lots of accessories. So all in all, this camera is well worth the money. It's a really great way to get into medium format. It is very versatile. You can do a lot of different things with it. And I mean, look at that. That's a, that's a nice looking camera. These were the king of fashion and editorial magazine shoots in the 80s. All the cool photographers used these or another 6.7 camera, a lot of Pentax 6.7s as well. Uh, so these have a great history. They are proven, 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 proven in the studio. Um, so you really can't go wrong getting this camera. And that's kind of it. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, another video coming for you next week. It's going to be the video about my color film processing workflow. So you got to get to see a little bit of a peek behind the curtain on how I process my color film at home. So make sure you stay here for that. Make sure you subscribe, tell your friends, follow me on Instagram. If you have any questions about the Mamiya RB67, you can leave me a comment or you can email me hello at cstormphoto.com. If you have questions about anything related to photography or coffee, you can email me hello at cstormphoto.com. Yeah, thank you for tuning in. Sorry for my extended absence. I promise I won't do it again. And I'll see you next week. Goodbye. Mm, cold coffee.